first reading today is chapter 37 of Genesis. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Silpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report upon them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made him an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bound down to it. His, father's, his brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze his father's flocks near Sheshem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Sesham. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived in Sesham, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there, where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognised it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph to, in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. The second reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 7, verses 1 to 16. Then the high priests asked Stephen, 
are these charges true? To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. For 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said, and afterwards they will come out of the country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of 12 patriarchs. Before the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave because into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent his forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem, and placed in the tomb that Abraham had brought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. Well, having heard God's word read, and before uh, we hear it preached for us, uh, let us declare together our common faith uh, in this, the Apostles' Creed. Together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here today. It's good to be able to open up the book of Genesis together and to go through uh, the story of Joseph together. If you have joined us uh, this morning or for the first time today, we are in the book of Genesis. We have been looking at Jacob's storyline and how God is fulfilling his promises to the, to, to, to the descendants of Abraham. And we have followed Jacob's line. He has left home and married and he has returned with children and livestock and he's in the land of Canaan now. And so the story zeroes in on one of his sons, Joseph. And now the rest of Genesis, nearly one third of this book, is taken up with Joseph's account. If you consider the detail that we read in this one third of Genesis of this one person, it's actually quite enormous. Well, if Joseph, Joseph, Joseph's life was a pilot for a TV show, it's the original rags to riches story and chapter 37 is a cracking first episode. He moves in his story from rejection and impoverishment to position of influence and governance over the chapters. Over the next chapters, there is tragedies, there are lies, there are failures, there are, there's a great famine that's coming that will put everybody's life at risk. And through it, Joseph is caught in the middle. His story is a testimony to God preserving Abraham's family. But 
Joseph's story also impacts more than those around him. He is actually a bridge. A bridge between God's promises made to the descendants of Abraham becoming the promises made to a nation of people. Joseph is a bridge between Genesis and the, the, the book of Exodus. He is one of the threads in the tapestry of God's redemptive plan through this nation Israel. This is an epic story and it brings Genesis to a wonderful crescendo. But it's also a story that opens up a very big topic for us, particularly today. And that topic is God's providence. Now, providence may not be a word that we use often, but Christians acknowledge that they live under it, and those who aren't Christians don't acknowledge that they live under it, but they do. (laughs) The word providence means the working of God's sovereignty to continually uphold and guide and care for his creation. In a sense, it's God's eternal stewardship, his eternal subduing of creation of all things. It affirms that the universe is not chaotic. God sees and and controls everything that's going on, from the simple and the feeble to the spectacular, to nations and galaxies. It tells us that God is not a passive participant or a spectator in our world but he sustains every square inch of it but there's a stumbling block for us when we think about God's providence you and I only see what's right in front of us at the start of my week Naomi and I will try to manage our calendar we share calendars on our apps and all kinds of things with her shift work in it we'll have my job and kids' commitments, we'll have food because that's an essential for three teenagers and one younger child. We manage her shift work and evening activities, church and school life and every week there are two consistent problems. One is unforeseen events that ruin everything. You never know what they're going to be but they know they're going to torpedo the week. And second, we can't control everything. We all have a very fragile display of providence and control in our life, don't we? In truth, we we control very little, if you really want to think hard about it. And when unforeseen events happen, it, it throws us into chaos. So the topic of God's providence, it's a personal issue, isn't it? Because we say, because we face these events and we say, did God bring this trouble on me? as we try to understand how God is overseeing the particulars of our life. See, there are some people in your life or in this room or in this church that will come here over the weekend that have gone through or in the middle of tragic circumstances and they are asking, how could God let this happen? The suffering and evil in the world is often the reason people won't believe in God. For them, suffering makes God a poor steward, a weak steward. Either he's powerless or he's careless. One or the other, you can pick. Well, this is why we need a right understanding of God's stewardship over creation. And so as we read Joseph today, there are two layers to this story. First is the particular of Joseph's life as we follow him on the road. And the second is God's providence in Joseph's story. And through these, we see what it means for us personally. So let's pray and then open up the story together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can open your word, knowing that through it you reveal yourself. Father, we thank you for Joseph and the man that that you chose from among the children of Jacob. Help us to read about your hand over his life, to humbly sit under its truth to apply it to our lives so that we may live faithfully under you and your providence for us. Amen. Well, we begin in verse 2 of chapter 37 with Joseph, Jacob's son. We start at a telling point when Joseph is 17 years old. He would always come in with bad reports about his brothers as they were shepherding in the fields with his dad's business. This is the first sign of trouble between Joseph and his brothers. 
Now, this could mean that he is, uh, you know, one of the youngest children and just causing trouble for his older brothers. But because he is the one, but because he is with the sons born to the concubines of his father, and because he is 17, we're told, he's probably the one acting with responsibility and maturity. He brought the moral compass to his older brothers and told dad about it. Well, Joseph was the son of Rachel, and it seems that his father's affections for Rachel, who has died, have passed on to Joseph. Jacob's affections for Joseph may have increased also as the oldest son, Reuben, in the last chapter of the scriptures we read, uh, slept also with his father's concubine. And so in verse 3, Jacob marks his love for Joseph by giving him a robe. It may have had many colours. It may have been long-sleeved with lots of material, but it is rich and ornate. A similar robe is worn by royalty in the book of 2 Samuel. The immediate result of this gift is not surprising given what we already know about Joseph and his brothers. When his brothers saw this in verse 4, That their father loved him more than them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. It causes great conflict, doesn't it? They see their father's love and they see that robe and they hate Joseph and they can't even be at peace with him anymore. Well, the coat represents position and significance. It could even indicate that Jacob was the only son receiving the inheritance and blessing of the firstborn given the other boy's failings. So when Joseph puts on the robe, it's acknowledging his present favoured status. And that that as a boy who is not the eldest can rise to this station would have been confronting for those brothers. And for us, as we read it, it begins a bit of a foreshadowing for Joseph's life, his rise to higher stations. But right now, this robe is the reason for his brother's hatred of him. The hatred of these brothers only grows when Joseph has two dreams. First, if you look at verse 5, all the brothers in this dream are binding sheaves together of grain. And suddenly Joseph's sheaf stands up And then the brothers' sheaths stand up and they bow down to his. And when the brothers hear about this dream of Joseph's, they immediately assume he's got delusions of grandeur. And they hated him. Even more, we're told. But this doesn't stop Joseph's dream. He has another one. In the next dream, the sun and the moon are there and there are 11 stars. And they are all bowing to Joseph. Notice everything's escalated in this dream. Mum and dad are now present as the sun and moon. The whole family are the stars, all paying respects to Joseph. And again, Joseph tells everyone, this boy seems unflappable at this moment, doesn't he? Sure, he's gone through some conflicts and he just keeps telling them. But his father scoffs at him this time in verse 10. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Know your station, pal. But but we're told Jacob, his father, keeps the matter in mind. So what do these dreams mean? Can the least and the unexpected son rise above the family's hierarchy to prominence? His father, Jacob, of all people, knows that God gives dreams that happen to him and they can lead to significant events. Well, now we move forward in time and at verse 12, Jacob tells Joseph that his brothers are near Shechem with the sheep again. He's grazing and he wants them to go. It could be that he wants them to be their moral compass and keep an eye on them again. Joseph seems undeterred by the conflict that seems to be happening and he agrees to this really 80 kilometre journey. And now as Joseph arrives, arrives out to Shechem, he only finds an empty land. 
the, his brothers and the sheep aren't there. But he stumbles upon a man, we're told. And now this guy is a bit of a mystery. Interestingly, it's the same word used to describe the man that Jacob wrestled with the night before he met Esau a few, in, in a few sermons ago. The man sees Joseph and asks what he is looking for. Joseph tells him about his brothers and so it happens that the man saw them go to Dothan, which is another 50 kilometres north. We don't know who this man is in the story, but he is instrumental in Joseph's fate, isn't he? Well, from here on at verse 18, we only hear the narrator and, his, and Joseph's brothers speaking. From some distance, the brothers see Joseph coming and they plan to kill him. They're far from home. They can cover it up. There won't be witnesses. They no longer see him as Joseph, their brother, but sarcastically, they just call him the dreamer. All they want to do is take away his significance of what the robe and the dreams give him. Reuben tries to rescue Joseph in verse 21 by having him thrown down a dry cistern rather than being killed. So when Joseph arrives, the brothers strip him. They take his clothes. They take his robe. He's not their brother anymore, really. And they put him down a dark hole. But this event, it's far from over. Judah says they gain nothing from killing him. And seeing a group of travel merchants far away, they decide to sell him for 20 pieces of silver as a slave. And when they have taken him out of the cistern and done so, Reuben then returns to the cistern wanting to get Joseph. Maybe he was trying to get back in his father's good books by saving the son he loves. But he only finds an empty cistern and his chance is missed. So the brothers now fabricate a lie about Joseph's death. They take the ornate robe, they dip it in goat's blood and arriving home they take the bloodied road to Jacob and they say, we found this, examine it to see whether it's your son. Notice they don't even call Joseph our brother. <laughs> they don't say we found the, the robe of our brother. He's just your son now. Notice they don't even create the story. They just let Jacob do that. And all Jacob can do is mourn the loss of his son. Well, what was used to mark Joseph as significant, what the dreams and the robe said about his position and his authority have now all become the reasons for his slavery in this story. Yet at verse 36, we have a little seed of hope from the narrator. It says, Joseph was sold again in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Joseph is now a th probably about a thousand kilometres from home. He is orphaned. He is no longer really a part of his family because they got rid of him. He's enslaved, but he's in another home connected to royalty and political governance in all of Egypt. So where is God? In the particular, how is his providential, e eternal stewardship over this? And what does this mean for us personally? Well, in the particular, God is there when Jacob gives Joseph the robe, pointing to a greater purpose. God is there when he has the dream signalling his significance. It's later in the story that Jacob describes dreams as being God's domain. God gives the dream and the meaning. And in Joseph's mind, that, that he knew what these dreams meant could only mean that it, God had made it so for him. But that is not all. God, is, God was guiding Joseph in the meeting with the man. God is also in the words of Reuben and Judah who spared Joseph from death. We will see that if Joseph had died that day, then that whole family would have died in the severe famine that's coming on them. So how can God use suffering to steward and guide Joseph? How can he do that? Well, Joseph will learn that unforeseen events don't damage the promises 
and the loving plans of God. In fact, God's providential hand secures his promises for Joseph and his family. And what suffering does is drive Joseph to trust God's grip on him. Tim Keller, in a book on suffering, says that Christianity contradicts all other beliefs and religions when it comes to suffering. Fatalism says there is nothing you can do about suffering. Karma says it's deserved. You've just got to get over it and work harder. Other religions say it's just an illusion. Secularism says suffering is pointless, so just avoid it at all costs if you can. While Christianity says there is purpose. There is purpose to suffering and and he says it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God. For the Christian, it can be truly unjust, uh, just, unexpected and painful in the moment, but it's never hopeless. And its purpose drives us deeper into trusting God's grip on us. The truth is God redeeming evil is the witness of God's power and stewardship over creation, isn't it? And that God secures his promises by his means shows he is lovingly providential. Joseph will see that God has been with him the whole way. He has not been hidden, he has not been absent, but he's been securing promises given to Joseph. And he's given glimpses to Joseph through this journey. This is what the robe is. This is what the dreams are. They are momentary glimpses of the role and plan God has. Yet for Joseph to see this, he must hang on to the end of this journey with God. He must wait to see why he is the man needed in Egypt with the famine coming. But this is where understanding God's providence gets personal for us, doesn't it? As this is the challenge of faith. All we read and see is Joseph in the moment to moment. The emotional flooding of the brothers as they sell him as a slave. The despair on Joseph's face as he's been sold. And like Joseph, we only find strength and comfort when we hold on to the glimpses and the provision of God that he gives on the journey. But unlike Joseph, we don't get a robe, (laughs) we don't get a dream. We get greater glimpses in this. We get Jesus Christ, don't we? We get Jesus Christ through the word. He is our bridge to receiving these eternal promises in God. Like Joseph will be for his family, Jesus is for us. And he gives us the glimpse of God's goal and the end of our journey. In reading this story, Joseph becomes an amazing lens to understanding Jesus Christ. The parallels between Joseph and Jesus are incredible if you read this story. Like Jacob loved Joseph, at Jesus' baptisms, God's fatherly voice rips the heavens open as he declares, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus is different to all men and all people. He is marked by God as his Christ. Then Jesus gives us glimpses of this kingdom that he is bringing free of sin and brokenness, glimpses of the journey's end. Yet Jesus' Israelite brothers despised him and plotted to execute him and they achieved that on the cross. But all they did was bring God's plan for forgiveness of sins. All they did was create the moment for Jesus to declare that God keeps his promises For those who believe in him, those who have faith in his atoning work on the cross are reconciled to their heavenly father. He is our glimpse of our journey's ends if we trust in God's promises. God's providence is personal, but regardless of your experience, the same saviour in the scriptures Unexpected traumas, events, sins and failings are not a sign of a careless, weak God who is a poor steward, but he is deepening your trust in his love and furthering you towards his kingdom. So let me close. In the moment to moment, 
if God's hand has never left you, if he has been stewarding you through the ascents and the descents of your life, and if Jesus Christ is the bridge and the end of our journey with God, then strengthen your grip, then, sorry, strengthen your trust in his grip. Strengthen your trust in his grip. Ask yourself what makes you afraid to trust God. What stops you from reading the scriptures and praying to him? What stops you from turning to him and seeing the hope he offers you all in his son? Jesus is the only bridge to God and his promises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have revealed your saving, sovereign grace to us in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to never limit your providential control and stewardship of creation, but help us to see how great it is when you redeem us from our sin and our failings. May you get the glory of our salvation and may we trust your grip on us. Amen.